Hello, and welcome to a supplemental lecture for my class, Experimental Methods, which is PSYC 440-640 at uh, NDSU in the spring of 2016. If you're enrolled in the class, you already know what it's about, but if you're not, it's basically a class that looks at univariate statistics from a rather applied perspective. We um, consider different aspects of the general linear model and particularly look at uh, things like ANOVA and regression. Now this lecture is designed to consider the influence of choices about doing one-tailed tests versus two-tailed tests and um, what the, the influence of those choices on the interpretation of the results of testing. So again, here's the, uh, the overview. I'm going to consider the issue of answering research questions, that is posing and then testing hypotheses, and we're going to look at the influence that uh, choosing a one-tailed test might have over choosing a two-tailed test. And at the very end, I'm going to briefly touch on the uh, one of the many reasons why small data sets are problematic and try and connect that back to one-tailed tests and two-tailed tests. So you probably already know uh, what one-tailed tests and two-tailed tests are if you're watching this video, but just by way of a quick review, if we consider a one-tailed test, like a one-tailed t-test for instance, we're thinking of a situation where we're imagining the probability distribution for that test statistic, but we're really only concerned with one tail of that distribution. It could be the right-hand tail or it could be the left-hand tail. And for reasons that will, I hope, seem obvious in a few more slides, this allows us to do some directional hypothesis testing because it lets us put all the probability of rejecting a null hypothesis on one end of the distribution versus another, which can also give us a little bit more power to detect effects, which could be a good thing or, or maybe not such a good thing, depending on the context in which we use it. In contrast, two-tailed tests are ones in which, again, we imagine a probability distribution for a test statistic, like a T, for instance, but we allow the probability for rejecting a particular hypothesis to occur or to kind of pile up at either end of that probability distribution. This um, allows us to make non or allows us to test non-directional hypotheses, which is something we often do in psychology and behavioral sciences for, for different kinds of reasons, um, because we're dividing the probability um, in either direction. Um, this produces a somewhat more conservative approach to testing, um, which has some advantages but also costs us a little bit in terms of power. So that's all uh, a little bit abstract, or, or maybe very abstract. Um, let's consider a, a concrete example, or at least one that I've modeled on real research. Let's imagine that you are an experimental psychologist or a psychophysiologist, and you're interested in studying the effects of ethanol, you know, alcohol that we, we drink, on the fear response. Um, this is actually an area of study that I used to do back in graduate school. So again, it's modeled a little bit on real research, including some research that I myself did. Um, we can imagine for the purposes of this little supplemental lecture that we have an independent experimental design, meaning we're bringing people into a laboratory or a relatively controlled setting. Um, it's independent in the sense that we're assigning people to one or another of two groups. And then it's experimental in the sense that we're going to manipulate some sort of an independent or predictor variable. In this case, our independent or predictor variable is going to be uh, beverage or, or dose. So people will either be in an alcohol condition or group where they'll consume alcohol and become intoxicated and having done this research myself and certainly many many people do, there are protocols for dosing folks as a function of their age and gender and weight to get a particular level of intoxication. So let's just imagine that of all the people we bring into our lab, half of them are going to be assigned to the alcohol group and they'll all get uh, elevated to a particular level of intoxication. The other half of the folks we bring into our lab are going to be in a no alcohol condition. It might be a straight no alcohol, it might be a placebo. We could actually talk a lot about the methodological differences there, but for the time being let's just uh, assume that it's a no alcohol condition. Those folks don't get any alcohol, they don't get drunk at all. That's our predictor variable, group or, or, or dose, however you want to call it. 
our dependent variable or our outcome variable is going to be a psychophysiological measure that's associated with fear response and that is the eye blink startle. Now technically how eye blink startle ref um, is uh, influenced by fear is a little bit more complicated than that. We could talk about eye blink startle under different emotional probes and so on but again for the purposes of this supplemental lecture let's just assume that how uh, strong your blink is if you're given a sudden unexpected stimulus like a sudden loud sound presented in a set of headphones how um, large that eye blink is and how quick it occurs has something to do with your ongoing emotional state particularly your level of fear it's a little bit more complicated than that but that's good enough for now so we've got a categorical uh, predictor variable or independent variable and we've got a continuous dependent variable or, or outcome variable And again, if all my talking confused you a little bit, here's a kind of a schematic for how the study would work. If we want to call this a true experiment, we're going to randomly assign people to their groups, the alcohol group and the no alcohol group. And then, as you can see, we're trying to measure eye blink startle reflex, and we're trying to see is there a difference between uh, the average eye blink startle of the folks who got the alcohol as compared to the folks who did not get the alcohol. Now let's see how uh, one-tailed tests versus two-tailed tests work here. Um, we're studying the effects of alcohol on fear response and we're using a small sample of folks. Actually, this is a ridiculously small sample of folks for an independent or between groups type design. But for reasons that I'll get to at the very end of this little supplemental lecture, I chose deliberately to use a small group of people. And let's imagine we're doing an independent t-test, just a pretty standard, almost kind of boilerplate um, hypothesis testing approach uh, or test statistic that we might use and you're probably familiar with from almost any stats class you've taken. This will allow us to look at a difference in the average startle between the no alcohol group and the alcohol group. So let's imagine that we have a situation in which we're looking at this effect of alcohol and fear response and our null hypothesis is tested with a two-tailed test. Here we're imagining for our null hypothesis that the difference between the groups is zero and with our alternative hypothesis again tested under a two-tailed approach we're imagining or we're, we're proposing that the difference between the groups is not zero. It could be the case that the folks in the alcohol group have a greater fear response or it could be the case that the group, the, uh, the folks in the alcohol group have a less uh, lessened fear response. So again, the, uh, using our two-tailed approach, null hypothesis says there is no difference and the alternative hypothesis says there is some difference. There's a non-zero difference, but it could go in either direction. So here's a, a diagram or of uh, representing a uh, probability distribution for our test statistic with eight, uh, the test statistic being a t-statistic with eight degrees of freedom and it is a um, sampling distribution or it's a sampling distribution, a probability distribution uh, under the null hypothesis and we know that because it's centered over zero um, and what I mean by that is that we could imagine that if we were to do this same study with exactly the same number of people a very large number of times, you know, technically I suppose an infinite number of times, most of the time um, if it really was the case that there was no difference between groups or no effect of alcohol and fear response, most of the time that we did all of these many many studies again and again we would find t-statistics that would be equal to or very close to zero. So the greatest amount of values in this distribution occur right around zero but of course it's possible and it would in principle occur over time if we did the studies enough that sometimes we'd have relatively large values of t stretching up in the positive direction and sometimes we'd have very um, uh, low or very large in the negative direction values of t stretching back in the uh, negative direction. So this is our our uh, sampling distribution or our probability distribution uh, for our test statistic under the null hypothesis.
Now let's just imagine that the test statistic we computed in our sample happened to be an even two. And I, I, I fiddled with this fake data to get it to come out just so, but just imagine that you were doing this study for real and you computed your t-statistic and it was two. And let's assume again that we're doing a two-tailed test. Now, if you were to look up a values um, in a statistics textbook or online, or indeed if you were to use Excel or SPSS or some program to look up values for the critical values of t, you would find uh, for a probability of 0.05, that you would find that the critical values for t for a two-tailed test are positive 2.26 and negative 2.26. These critical values are just the values that break up this probability distribution or this sampling distribution into regions such that 5% of the possible values lie beyond the shaded area here and 95% of the possible values lie within it. We call these critical values just because for us in psychology and most of the behavioral sciences, it's critical or it's, it's thought to be important or, or it's statistically significant that we identify regions of the probability distribution that include 95% of the possible values or 5% of the possible values. So again, if this was old school and you're looking this up in a textbook, you would look up um, your T values for particular uh, degrees of freedom, eight in this case, and you'd find that for two-tailed tests, the critical values are positive 2.26 and negative 2.26. Now, given that in our study that we've supposedly now just done, our value of T was an even 2.0, that value falls within the region that's shaded. The probability associated with those values is not uh, less than 0.05. It's greater than 0.05, it's about 0.08. So based on uh, this analysis, we wouldn't reject the null hypothesis. We would retain the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the fear response of people who drank alcohol and people who did not. Now we haven't proved that there's no difference. We just began with the assumption that there was no difference and we couldn't find evidence to reject that assumption or that, that beginning position that we have with our null hypothesis. So again, our test statistic t equals two occurs within the null distribution or the probability distribution under the null and it occurs not infrequently, or at least it occurs more frequently than 5% of the time. And for us, that's not enough to be considered critical or significant. Well, let's imagine the same sort of analysis, except this time what we're going to do is look at the effects of alcohol on fear response under a one-tailed approach. So here, our null hypothesis for the one-tailed approach is actually the same. It's just that the difference between the alcohol group and the no alcohol group is zero. But under our, uh, a one-tailed approach, our alternative hypothesis is a little bit different. It's that the difference between the alcohol group and the no alcohol group is positive. Or it could be negative, but let's just say, you know, for this purpose, that we're imagining that we're testing a positive effect. That if we subtract the fear response of the no alcohol people and we subtract from it the fear response of the alcohol people uh, will have a positive value, meaning the folks who drink alcohol had less fear response. Um, let's imagine that there's a literature of studies out there or that there are sets of good theories which give us a reason to predict that. You know, we imagine that alcohol is a stress response dampening or fear attenuating effect and thus it's reasonable for us to presume or to predict that uh, folks who receive alcohol will have a lessened fear response. So we predict that. We don't predict it will be just some difference. We predict that it will be specifically a positive difference. So again, here's our probability distribution, you know, a sampling distribution of our test statistic T under the null hypothesis, again, it's centered over zero. It has the same degrees of freedom as before. And let's again suppose that our t statistic, our test statistic that we computed is an even 2.0. Um, but this time it's a one-tailed test. And if you were to look up in a textbook or if you were to use SPSS or Excel or some other stats program to find it, you would find that for a one-tailed test, the critical value for, uh, for t um, 
in this distribution with these degrees of freedom is 1.86. So again, the critical value is just breaking up the probability distribution into different regions. In this case, it's a region that extends all the way out into infinity in one direction. So it's a directional test. And so you can see here in the shaded uh, box, the shaded box refers to or sort of indicates 95% of all the possible values that are going to occur in that probability distribution. And uh, that's to the left and to the right in the unshaded area, that's where 5% of the values will occur. Now, our test statistic t equals 2 is greater than that critical value. And the probability associated with our test statistic is about 0.04, which of course is less than 0.05, our normal kind of a critical uh, probability value that we use for uh, rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. So what we find here is that that same t value t equals 2, it occurs in the null distribution, but it occurs fairly infrequently. It occurs only about 4% of the time, and 4% is less than 5%, and for reasons that have to do with the history of how we do statistics in a lot of areas of psychology, that's good enough for us. That's, that's rare enough for us that we think that this null distribution is probably not an accurate representation of what's really going on. We think that there really is a difference between the uh, fear response of people who consume alcohol and the fear response of people who do not, and particularly that that difference is in a positive direction. So to just kind of bring it back again and, and review a little bit, one-tail tests um, allow us to use just one uh, end of the probability distribution or, um, and I'm using probability distribution, sampling distribution interchangeably here, and I'm sure uh, a savvy mathematician would point out that there's a subtle difference, but what I mean by that is the uh, sampling distribution would be just if we repeatedly computed a, a statistic, in this case a t, over an infinite number of times, we get a distribution of values that would reflect a probability. So probability distribution, sampling distribution, for my purposes, the same thing. A one-tailed test allows us to just use one end of that distribution and allows us to test directional hypotheses, which sometimes we really like to do. A two-tailed test, on the other hand, uses both ends of the probability distribution. It divides up the probability of uh, you know, rejecting a null hypothesis, assuming that that distribution is for the null hypothesis and centered over zero in the case of a t-statistic. It allows us to use both ends of that distribution and test a non-directional hypothesis. And for reasons that I'll talk about in a little bit, sometimes we like to do that. Now, hopefully the example that I gave illustrated, I think, an interesting point. And that interesting point is that for a one-tailed test, in a sense, it's easier to find an effect. The test statistic can be smaller and still be significant with respect to p equals 0.05. Like we used in my two examples, uh, the same test statistic, t equals 0. And t, uh, I'm sorry, t equals 2.0. And t equals 2.0 was good enough to be significant or was big enough to be significant uh, in a one-tailed test using that same uh, probability distribution for t. It actually could have been slightly smaller because I think the critical value was about 1.86, so it might have been just over the line. It maybe even could be slightly smaller and still be significant. In contrast with a, a two-tailed test, in a sense it's harder to find a significant effect. A particular test statistic has to be bigger in order to cross that threshold or cross that critical value and uh, allow us to, using our normal p less than 0.05 criterion, reject the null hypothesis. Now an important point to make here, a really important point, is that decisions about whether to use a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test really should be made a priori. That means ahead of time, and particularly here it means ahead of when we've actually gathered our data and begun to do our analyses. And we should make these decisions based on strong theory-driven hypotheses or um, and or a good literature of published results from other studies which guide our decision making. If we have good reason to believe in this example that alcohol is only going to, or at least is massively 
more likely to decrease fear response than it is to possibly increase fear response, then maybe it'll, uh, it would be good to test a directional hypothesis. Um, it would be somewhat more informative, perhaps, of our theory, uh, assuming we have a good theory as to why alcohol decreases uh, fear response, and also would allow us to take advantage of a greater power for our test, a greater possibility to detect an effect that's really there. Of course, if we don't have a really good theory, um, or if we don't have a good body of literature to guide us, a more conservative approach would be to do a two-tailed test where we acknowledge that, hey, maybe alcohol could decrease fear response, but it's, it's conceivable it could increase fear response as well. Um, in psychology and in a lot of behavioral sciences, our theories are not as precise as we would probably like them to be, and it's if we're really honest about ourselves, um, it's usually not possible for us to make strong directional predictions about effects. And so good, responsible researchers usually use as their default a two-tailed test because they want to be conservative. They want to avoid increasing the likelihood of a type 1 error or a false positive when they're evaluating the results of their study. At the risk of further emphasizing this point, deciding about whether to use a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test should not be made post hoc or after the fact. And indeed, doing that is suspect. Um, you could ask someone who is doing this, are you just trying to find an effect that's less than P equals, or the, find an effect um, such that, you know, the probability of your test statistic is less than 0.05. Um, you could imagine in my example, a researcher began with a rather conservative approach of saying, oh, I, I just want to test a two-tailed test, and he or she was really disappointed because the test statistic wasn't big enough, and the probability of it wasn't small enough, and they thought, oh, now I can't write up that paper I really want to write, and maybe I won't get the promotion at my job I really want. Hmm, maybe I'm going to revise my plans and only test with a one-tailed test, and wouldn't you know it, now that very same data the same value of a test statistic has yielded, apparently, a statistically significant result. Um, that's a little bit like cheating. In fact, that's one of many different practices which nowadays we call p-hacking or questionable research practices uh, or other names to suggest kind of trickery. Um, and it's important to acknowledge here that people can do this because it's very easy to convince ourselves after the fact that we sort of knew all along that the results would, say, go in one direction as compared to another. Once we've gathered all the data and observed in our sample that, oh, well, on average, people in the alcohol group had less fear response, at least indicated by startle, than did people in the non-alcohol group, it's easy to convince ourselves that we thought that would be the way all along, and moreover, that we think that's going to be the way it generally is in the population. Um, again, a more honest person, a more responsible person, would try to make a good decision about this ahead of time and then hold himself or hold herself to that decision uh, through their analyses, come what may. Here's an interesting point. Um, in creating this uh, mini lecture and coming up with this example, as I often try to do in other lectures, um, in order to make a situation or have a data set where the decision about using a one-tailed test versus a two-tailed test would yield two different outcomes uh, in terms of our, our interpretation of our test statistic, um, I had to use a very small set of data. You saw in my data set that I had only 10 people. Um, that's a pretty small data set, especially considering that it's an independent design, so five people were in one group and five people were in another. Um, I did that deliberately so that when I ran through my analyses, my analyses would work out, so to speak, when I used a one-tailed test, but they wouldn't work out when I used a two-tailed test. So small data sets uh, were necessary for this lecture. But small data sets, as, as we know, or as I, as I hope we all know, are problematic for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, one reason that small data sets are problematic is we have very good reason to think that they're not going to be representative of the population they're drawn from. You could imagine that the population uh, that is being studied in my little example here is people. You know, maybe if we want to restrict ourselves, we'll say adult people or people who even restrict ourselves more, we say people who drink alcohol 
who are hopefully mostly adults, um, that's a pretty large and diverse group of people. It's unlikely, just um, sort of at a conceptual level or the kind of a mathematical and probabilistic level, that the 10 people that we brought into our laboratory to do this supposed study could in any way be all that well representative of that broad population. So one reason why we just don't like small samples, or at least we shouldn't like them, is that they're unlikely to be representative of our, our population, and thus any claims we can make uh, based on the results of our study about the population are suspect. Uh, the external validity of these claims is, is questionable. Another reason that's somewhat related here is that when we think about uh, small samples, the sample statistics that we can compute with them, whether those are descriptive statistics like the mean of one group or the mean of another group, or if they're test statistics like a t-value or, or some other test statistic, all of those are going to have, or they're going to tend to have large standard errors, meaning that the estimates that we can make from them, from the sample out to the population as a whole, are going to be necessarily imprecise. So the standard error for the mean of the fear response or the startle response in the alcohol group is going to have a pretty large standard error, at least as compared to what size the standard error would be if there were 50 people in that group. The consequence of that is the estimate we can make from the sample of people who are in the alcohol group to the population of people who could in principle be in the alcohol group is going to be a pretty imprecise estimate. Also, the t-statistic, our test statistic that we're using to compare the means for those two groups, that's also going to be pretty imprecise. A kind of a really interesting point that, that occurred to me, or at least that I think about, or I thought about when I was making this little lecture, is that although we have reason to believe that small samples are problematic for the two reasons I described, and actually probably for quite a few others that we could describe or we could talk about if we took the time. It just seems to be the case that people, that's researchers and non-researchers alike, tend to often fall into the trap of mistakenly thinking the observations they make in small data sets are representative of populations. Uh, this phenomenon, this, this sort of mistaken way of thinking, is called the belief in the law of small numbers. And a number of people over the years have commented on it. In psychology, probably the most famous are uh, Tversky and Kahneman in their 1971 Psych Bull paper, where they talked about this idea that when we observe a small group of people, unless we really force ourselves not to, we tend to assume that that small group of people is well representing a larger group. So if you, um, if you like a particular style of music, it's easier for you to imagine that most people do just because most of your friends do. Or if all of your friends tend to vote Republican or vote Democrat, it's kind of easy for you to assume that most people just do that same as you, as you and your friends do. Um, this law of small numbers is, or belief in the law of small numbers, is just kind of a, a cognitive trap or a mistake that most people just tend to lapse into. Um, and it's, uh, you know, an example of how this works is in our own study. Let's imagine that we observed some sort of an effect, an apparent effect of alcohol on fear response in our sample. It would be easy for us to imagine that this effect would hold for the whole population. And especially if we've been kind of messing around with using a one-tailed test versus a two-tailed test, maybe post hoc making a decision that really we thought the one-tailed test was going to be appropriate all along, we kind of compound that natural problem that all people have, the tendency to believe in the law of small numbers, with this sort of additional problem that researchers, or at least researchers who use null hypothesis significance testing approaches like the one I've described, this other problem that we lapse into, which is that we can tend to make it maybe too easy to find a significant effect if we, among other things, fiddle around with doing a one-tailed test when maybe we should have done a two-tailed test. So let's review really quickly. The point of this little supplemental lecture is that choices that we make about whether using a one whether to use a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test do influence the interpretations that we make. Uh, for our hypothesis testing, at least with respect to our p less is, p is equal or is less than 0.05 criterion that we often use in psychology and, and in other sciences. Uh, not all sciences, but some other sciences. So 
recognizing that, we have to remind ourselves that we should make decisions about whether to use a one-tailed test or two-tailed test a priori, and that those decisions should be based on theory-driven hypotheses that we care about testing. Somewhat relatedly, I also want to make the point in this lecture that larger data sets are generally better than smaller data sets. We could, if we want to be really fussy, we could come up with instances and examples where that's not always true. But generally speaking, uh, it's better to have a lot of people in your data set than not a lot of people in your data set. And indeed, decisions about sample size, uh, the size of the data set, should be also made a priori. We should plan ahead of time to recruit 50 people or 100 people or 150 people or however many for our sample. And those decisions should be based on power analysis calculations, which is a topic that I'm talking about in my class next week and which is a topic that uh, I probably will do some sort of a supplemental lecture on as well. So hopefully this has been a helpful uh, mini lecture or supplemental lecture. If you're in my class uh, and if you were a little bit confused about one-tailed tests versus two-tailed tests when I talked about it last time, hopefully this has helped. If it hasn't, let me know. That's really all I have for now. Uh, thanks for your attention. Um, if you're tired or thirsty after all, listening to all of this, make yourself a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, perk yourself up and think about what you've learned hopefully. And if you have questions, uh, let me know. Thanks so much.